Welcome to our next lecture, Automobile Design. So I wanted to do something kind of fun and also relevant since our college is called Henry Ford College. If you're listening to this from Henry Ford College, maybe I'll reuse it. Uh, so I wanted to talk about 20th century automobile design. And I basically start with the 30s and go to about the 70s. And in each decade, I pick just one automobile manufacturer and talk about basically one or two of their designs. So we can get an idea on how some of the ideas we've been talking about in art, how they could possibly apply to other visual products, such as cars. So the first maker that we'll talk about is Bugatti. And if you're familiar with the brand, the modern one today, Bugatti, it really has nothing to do uh, with the brand that I'm going to talk about, Bugatti. Um, the only relationship is they took a few of the visual languages, uh, such as the grill that has a horseshoe shape. But other than that, there's no relationship to the company other than the name. So as you can see in some of these Bugattis, and this is how Bugatti got famous, uh, they were race cars. And in the 1910s and 1920s, and 1930s even, race cars weren't usually, race car drivers weren't usually professionals. They were just rich, usually men, who wanted to do some fun things. Um, but that's, Bugatti was able to make some vehicles, race cars, that were really effective at some of the more important races, such as the 24 Hours of Le Mans. So that's how he kind of got started. But he, uh, as you can see, he lived from 1881 to 1947, was born into an artistic family. His brother Rembrandt was a sculptor. Uh, and if you go to the a lot of museums, you'll find some of his sculptures. He was famous for doing sculptures of animals, especially in bronze. And his father, Carlo, was a furniture designer at the Detroit Institute of Art. There is a Carlo Bugatti design there in the modern section in the big hallway. Um, so he began as an engineer, so not quite artistic, but certainly creative if you're an engineer. And he began making race cars, as I mentioned before. As his name suggests, he's Italian, but he actually started his factory in France. So the color Bugatti, which is used by the modern company of Bugatti, um, came to be this particular blue that was the color that French race cars had to use in international races. So he started out with race cars, and he actually made some cars that were relatively affordable. Uh, so not like the cheapest car on the market, but not the most expensive, and certainly not just for wealthy people. Um, so something that an engineer could get. But he wasn't necessarily very successful with those cars. Uh, it's probably not a good transition to go from race cars, where they only have to last for a certain amount of time, two cars that regular people have to use all the time. What he became known for historically is these very opulent kind of over-the-top cars and the Bugatti Royale, of which there were only a few made, six and three were sold, um, is probably one of his most well-known and well-copied designs. Um, so this particular one that we see in the picture is Bugatti's personal vehicle, uh, he wasn't super wealthy, actually, <laughs> uh, but he did have enough money to have a driver. So you can see it right there. Um, and the cars, though, were for only the super wealthy. Um, so you can see that it was designed 1929. That year is pretty significant. So the chassis only, meaning the part of the car that includes the wheels, the motor, and a suspension and the frame. Back then, cars had a separate frames. More on that later. Um, just that was $30,000, which would be $400,000 in 2012. So uh, then you would get a coach builder. And many of the coach builders had been building coaches, uh, horse-drawn coaches. And when people started making cars, they moved into that. And the coach could be of equal price or more. So the coach would include the body, um, the metal coverings, 
and the seats on the inside and other things like luggage and upholstery and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that could be more than a chassis. So it would be about the equivalent of today's money, a million dollars. So pretty sim similar to the modern but unrelated company of Bugatti. Just super wealthy people are going to be buying this. As you can see with this particular car, you wanted to put a giant motor in it. This base, the point of this car was basically to show off the kind of technology that he could develop. So it had this incredibly large motor, which made the car very smooth. Uh, it's unlike large motors today. The idea with large motors back then was to reduce vibration um, and to make the cars really quiet. Um, so it was very successful in that regard as a technological experiment, but it wasn't even as successful as selling to wealthy people because many wealthy people stopped buying very opulent cars during the Great Depression um, because probably because they don't want to be targets for uh, guillotines. So you may recognize the proportions of this vehicle, which are kind of absurd in a modern sense because so much of the the length of the car is dedicated towards the motor and not for seating people um, and it was used in the Disney movie 101 Dalmatians and driven by Cruella de Vil so it became kind of a symbol for uh, exploited of wealthy people um, so kind of accurate in that way uh, this particular example is in the Musée National de la Automobile in France. And then there's one more example at the Henry Ford uh, in Dearborn. And that's all three examples that uh, were sold. So the symbol of the Bugatti family was an elephant. Uh, families back then would do that. They'd have symbols. Uh, so the hood ornament, which was pretty fancy, was designed by his brother Rembrandt. Um, and he put these on the regular cars that were lower price as well. Um, but I don't believe the modern Bugatti brand has really continued that sort of thing. So moving on to a more conventional and larger company, uh, but an unconventional design, uh, we'll talk about the Chrysler Airflow for the 1930s. Uh, so this is the Airflow sedan. And although this may look kind of old to you or like a regular old car, uh, it was quite radical at the time. One of the ideas was that you could use smaller motors um, and get more passenger space by streamlining the car. In other words, making it able to pass through um, the air more easily. Uh, and streamlining it had already been used in trains and in trains, it was used um, in a way that wasn't symbolic. It was it was for real. Um, however, in the Chrysler Airflow, it was more of just a design choice. They didn't really do aerodynamic studies to come up with it, but it did look kind of futuristic. Um, so the train that you see pictured, designed with a wind tunnel, not so much the car. Uh, so... The train that's pictured is a 1934 Union Pacific Streamliner. So the person who was put in charge of designing the car and also designing the marketing for the car was Norman Bell Geddes. Um, so he was a poster designer. And I'm going to show you a poster in a minute. And it's kind of useful to think of who is he selling to or what's he communicating in the poster. Um, so this particular car, even though it had a lot of new things that were going on, uh, like it had what's called a monocoque body, that means a body where the metal part that you see of the car and the underneath parts that include the suspension, uh, the frame, they were all one piece. And that's the way pretty much all cars are made nowadays. Sometimes trucks are made with separate frames. Um, so you may, if you have a very large SUV, it may be made with a separate frame and then large pickup trucks, but even some of those are made with a monocoque body because it enables you to have a safer, uh, lighter and stiffer car, uh, which means that it'll handle better on the road and be safer for that reason. So let's take a look at the poster and see how this was marketed. <laughs> 
So you can kind of take a look at it. Um, the first real motor car, according to Sayer, uh, this poster. And I would suggest pausing the video right here and trying to figure out what are they selling here? Um, look at the way that the people are dressed. Look at the way that they are in relationship to the car and try to think about what Gettys is trying to sell and what messages he's trying to communicate. Okay, so pause is over. I'll give you an idea of what, when I do in-person classes, what people usually say. They look at the people and they mention that, wow, they're all dressed up in fancy clothes. They're wearing hats. Uh, they all look pretty well off. And the car is right in the center. It's almost like it's a show, an exhibition, and the car is the star of the show, and everyone's kind of turning towards it. Um, so you can kind of see, and also people mentioned that everyone's white, uh, which would be a symbol of wealth at the time. Oftentimes, people also mention that these people seem to be fashionable. So that's what Gettys is selling. He's selling, this is something new. This is something that well-off, successful people are interested in. Um, the association with whiteness, of course, at that time, um, because of white supremacy, would be like, yes, white people are better. Um, therefore, they're the ones that are interested in it. And rich people are better, and therefore, they're the ones that are interested in it. But the marketing didn't really work, because even though the car pretty much resembles what later cars would look like in the 1940s, for instance. Um, at the time, people thought it was ugly. They were used to cars that were more in the shape of the Bugatti we saw, even if they were smaller. Um, and because it was the middle of the Great Depression, um, it wasn't super expensive, but it was expensive enough that it wasn't a success. But I guess you could say Chrysler had the last laugh because it did all of the things that it did trying to make more space for the passengers, uh, monocoque body, all of those things are used in later cars and are pretty much standardized nowadays. So the next brand we're going to look at, we're going to skip the 40s because during World War II, um, people stopped developing cars. There were military vehicles that were developed, um, but other than the Jeep, they didn't really have a huge effect on what happened later on. Um, so we'll look at Cadillac, and I'm going to try to explain this in the context of what was happening with the Cold War. And one thing I'll, I'll just say about the Cold War is it's often thought to be uh, a war between communism and capitalism. Uh, and I think that might be sort of the wrong way to think of it. Um, <laughs> the great Noam Chomsky said once that only two countries thought that um, the Soviet Union was communist, the U.S. and the Soviet Union. <laughs> um, so it was more about a propaganda battle for influence over the world, uh, which the U.S. was always more powerful um, and also more exploitative around the world. So the idea was in this post-war world that the U.S., first off, they had taken over some of the old empires, eventually becoming the world's largest empire very quickly, actually, um, and still today. And their idea of influence was to spread the idea that free markets, and they didn't really mean that, what they meant was capitalism, um, around the world and try to associate that with prosperity. Um, so that led to solutions that weren't always the best, uh, but they were almost like, propaganda for showing, yes, we can get the biggest and best things. Um, so the particular car we're looking at was influenced kind of like the airflow uh, by a different sort of vehicle, um, the U.S. Air Force P-38 Lightning. So Harley Earl, who was the boss that was in charge of designing the cars at this particular time at GM, um, and you know, basically set the design language for the rest of the American industry because GM was so successful. Um, he was shown during World War II this experimental uh, jet engine plane uh, called the P-38. Um, and he was really impressed by the shapes of it. Um, after the war, 
uh, the U.S. had developed um, some technologies like rockets. They brought over a bunch of Nazi scientists to help them with that. Um, and by the 1950s, people were kind of looking forward to a future where we would be able to travel in space uh, and expand out <laughs> into the universe, I guess you could say. Um, so these two sets of influences kind of led to the idea of having um, these fins on Cadillac cars. And they might look kind of awkward and useless. They are useless. <laughs> but they were trying to show this idea, capitalism is better. It's so much better that, you know, we have the greatest technology. If you know history at all, you know that both the Soviet Union and the U.S. were pretty successful with developing space programs. Um, but again, we're kind of talking about the propaganda. So another element that kind of led to very large cars like this being developed was um, the encouragement of by the business world and by the government through the development of infrastructure like the highways was to get people to move to the suburbs. Um, and this was done in a very, hopefully you learn this history in other classes, in a very racist way. Um, it's called redlining. They basically gave special discount loans uh, to white people in certain neighborhoods, and they wouldn't allow um, black people to be able to live in those neighborhoods. Um, and that led to the type of segregation that you see today. And if you live in Detroit, that led to um, the wealth of being of Detroit being sucked out of it and moved out to the suburbs. So with this, people needed cars. So you can kind of see how the car industry is into this whole suburban thing. Um, and they wanted it to look new. They wanted it to represent what they believed America was all about. So kind of the ultimate development of these ideas that bigger is better, better and excess, you know, capitalism produces so much that you can have an excess of things is the 1958 Fleetwood convertible. And this is kind of the opposite idea of the quite practical Chrysler airflow that we saw before and closer really to the Bugatti. Um, as you can see, the cap passenger compartment is rather small. Uh, the car is taken up by a lot of useless space. And unlike the Bugatti Royale, the engine doesn't actually take up most of this space. There's a big giant space in the front uh, that's practically empty between the radiator and the motor. Uh, and same thing with all this kind of excess in the back. They didn't even have a trunk that took up all of this space. So again, this wasn't the most practical. Um, you know, capitalism doesn't usually make practical decisions. It makes profitable ones. Uh, so this particular car was kind of the ultimate symbol of, of American excess in a way. Um, so you can compare the length and the weight of the car. And the weight of the car is actually very similar to modern SUVs, about 5,300 pounds. Um, but the length of it is very long. You can compare it to my car, the Scion XB, uh, which is admittedly the lightest car <laughs> that you can buy that seats four people, uh, but it's almost, it's more than uh, twice as heavy as the Scion XB. So things changed in capitalism. You eventually had to have different sorts of vehicles. Uh, and that's why we have some of the vehicles we have today. But I would say that SUVs um, and trucks and so many people owning them, especially people that don't need them, which is most people, um, that they came to be marketed over other cars because they're more profitable. Um, so a similar kind of thinking with SUVs and the Cadillac Fleetwood. If you look at the back of it, you can see the like kind of rocket age type of design. Um, again, it may seem silly in retrospect, but the idea was they were selling not just a vehicle, they were selling kind of a dream, a dream of success. A dream of success that was a reality for some people in the 50s and 60s, especially white people, um, but one that was short-lived and an exception um, to the way that capitalism works normally. So this is the beginning of the space race. Uh, the Soviet Union had put up Sputnik by this time. 
um, and it beat U.S. in the space race, but the U.S. eventually put a man on the moon first. Uh, so this idea of communism versus capitalism is kind of a misnomer in a way. Um, both societies have a sort of capitalism. They just um, organize it in different ways. Um, but in the U.S., the idea was excess is good. Uh, in the Soviet Union, it was more like we have to have the best solutions, uh, the most practical solutions. So we move on to the 60s, and I could pick a lot. Speaking of things that aren't practical, <laughs> I picked pretty much the least practical cars that have ever been made, and that's Lamborghini. Uh, but I think they're interesting visually, uh, and some of the cars we're going to look at had an influence on pretty much all of the cars that are like them. Um, and even cars that are not like them um, that followed. Uh, so the Lamborghini company was originally a tractor company, and they still make tractors today. If you go to Italy and other parts of Europe, um, if the Lamborghini you're most likely to see is going to be a tractor. Um, so Ferruccio Lamborghini was the founder of the company. Uh, and in 1964, he said, you know, Look at these companies, these other Italian companies like Maserati and Ferrari and such. They're making cars for rich guys because at that time, they didn't have a lot of planes that went back and forth over Europe. Uh, and rich executives would need something pretty fast um, to be able to get from one place of Europe to the other. So they developed these cars called GT, meaning grand touring cars, cars that could get you and perhaps a companion somewhere relatively quickly, like the United States um, and Europe, especially in France and in Germany, they had built a lot of highways. So it was pretty easy to do that. So um, he thought he could do it better than, than Ferrari. Ferrari is kind of well known for running for a few hundred miles and then breaking down. Um, and he decided he was going to do this in a way that was not like Ferrari though. He tried to hire the youngest designers that went to the best schools. Um, one of them was Gian Paolo Dallara, uh, and Marcello Gandini, um, at the design house of Bertona, who designed Bertone, who designed the Miura in 1966. Uh, so at this time, Delara uh, and Gandini, um, Delara, I believe, was only 21 years old. Uh, so he'd actually gone through college pretty fast uh, and got hired and was already designing one of the most beautiful um, cars uh, that had ever been designed. At least that's what a lot of people think. So the idea with this car was kind of new. He took some ideas from um, the racing world and that if you want to go fast and you want to handle very well and sharply, uh, instead of putting the motor in the front, you put it in the middle of the car. So believe it or not, the motor is located right there. Um, and he kind of shaped the car over that just particular engineering choice. Um, so it looked quite different than what people were doing at the time. Um, the front was still longer than it needed to be. But remember, people are using this for traveling. So they used the front for um, luggage, and they had specialized luggage that came with the car that fit just perfectly inside of it. Um, so Lamborghini, he always used the symbol of the bull. Uh, remember, he was making tractors before. Um, and he decided when he was making cars that all of the cars would be named after a fighting bull, with one exception, which we'll look at. Um, so either a fighting bull or the owner of a fighting bull. So even though he's Italian, he's really fond of bullfighting um, in Spain. So he thought this would be cool. So this particular one is named after Don Arduardo Miura Fernandez um, and his fighting bull, the Miura. So you can kind of see that the car follows some design choices uh, that had already been used in race cars and will become very popular. Um, in the so-called sport car segment, meaning cars that are for fun as much as getting somewhere. Um, so this idea of putting this long, unbroken line over the car to kind of emphasize that it goes fast. You have a bigger kind of hump line over the rear wheels showing this is where the power is delivered. 
people have also mentioned that these times of shapes represent um, the, the curves of the human body, especially women's bodies. So it could be kind of related to the idea of thinking of women's bodies as beautiful as well. Um, shapes like this, which became really popular um, in cars designed in the United States, like the Mustang, came to be known as the Coke bottle shape because they kind of resemble, resembled a Coke bottle in that they were skinnier in the front and then fatter in the back. So the car after this, they actually designed a few before this. Um, it almost seemed like it came from the future at the time. Uh, and I think that's kind of accurate because a lot of people associate this particular design with the 1980s, um, but it was designed in the early 70s. And these pictures I'm showing you are from 1971. So they hired Marcello Gandini again and to design this car. Um, and when there's a bunch of stories how, how the name existed, uh, but one of the stories is, is that um, they did a, what car makers will do when they do a design, they'll make a full-sized mock-up out of clay. And that way you can look and see what the car looks like. And also the engineers can get an idea of what they have to work with. So he did that and he had it painted. It looked really real. Uh, and he showed it to Lamborghini. And Lamborghini was supposedly exclaimed, um, Countach. Uh, which could mean a bunch of different things. Uh, basically, just someone kind of blown away by something that they think is really cool. Uh, supposedly, it's also used as a phrase that if you see um, a very beautiful woman walk by, and especially from the rear view, you'd be really impressed and you would say Countach. Uh, so needless to say, he was pretty impressed. And this thing is, you can kind of see how it follows similar design language to the Mira, even though it looks quite different, there is that curve. But when you see it from other angles, it just seems like it's full of straight lines. Uh, it almost looks like an alien spaceship uh, that had landed. So here's another thing. And these openings for the doors are hideously impractical. Um, they do have one good use in that they allow this part of the car to be solid, so it can be stiffer, which is good for sport cars and all cars in general. Um, and But this was never meant to be production ready. Um, but what Lamborghini liked to do is say, hey, this design, just make it like that. Um, and that led to a lot of problems. Um, so when they tried to develop the car into a car that would actually go somewhere that had uh, a motor in it, um, that became kind of a problem um, because you couldn't have all those clean lines. You can see from the top where everything looks very um, straight lines rather than curved lines. You couldn't have all these clean lines because the motor would overheat. It was a rather large 12-cylinder motor. So they had to add all of these gills to try to get um, air into the motor, which didn't quite work. The car was known for overheating. Um, and then that cool line that goes across the back um, allows for a rear window that is absurdly tiny, like the size of two shoe boxes next to each other, basically. Um, and as you might imagine, you can't really see much back there. Uh, and some people mentioned uh, when they were showing this, you know, kind of uh, possible real life car. Um, to the car magazines, people are saying, well, like, you can't see what's behind you. What if you need to back up? And he's like, well, this isn't meant to be parked. <laughs> so no parallel parking. You wouldn't be able to anyway. Uh, it has a turning circle that's ridiculously huge. Um, and the big window design, which looks really cool, especially from the angle we're looking at, um, was a nightmare uh, as far as designing wipers. Um, so nobody in the industry had ever seen a window like this before. Uh, in fact, just designing and manufacturing the window made the car more expensive. Um, and they didn't know what to do with it because it has this kind of straight line that's going down. So they tried to design these wipers that were basically this huge wiper that goes across. 
it basically barely worked and you couldn't really see out of the car. And then they asked Lamborghini about it. And he's like, well, you shouldn't drive it in the rain either. So no parking and no driving in the rain. So this is kind of the finished production car. Um, and it was being produced still in the early 70s. But again, it's kind of associated with the 80s. So the original design is very impractical. Usually design cars that you see at shows, when the car manufacturers make them, they make it more practical. But that's not what Lamborghini did. So this car was always a problem. Later on, they eventually figured out how to make relatively reliable cars. Um, but this particular shape came to be associated with high technology with super fast cars. And pretty much no new shape has been created since then uh, for uh, very fast cars made for rich people. Um, they're pretty much all a variation of this. Uh, and with that last design choice, I think this would be a good place to end.